Well, thank you, Lou. You've been studying up. I've <laughs> so I should confess, when I was an undergraduate, I took a required biology class. I had to take something outside my area of mathematics. So I took Dr. Kleps's, uh, Ed Kleps's, uh, uh ecology class. And in it, one day, he, said, he used the words mathematical ecology. And I thought, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> And I feel like I've been try I'm still trying to figure out what all that is. So, you know, it was really an epiphany moment. So sometimes these other classes you need to take are, are really useful. And, you know, they lead you to new directions. I, I feel like I was really in the right place at the right time, which has been great. And I sort of was when bioenergy fell into my lap. I'd been doing lots of different things. And um, Mark Downing walked into my office and said, the Ecological Society of America is doing a workshop on bioenergy and they don't have any of the Department of Energy people involved and you know you need to get involved and I said well you know it's funny I have a conference call with ESA about a workshop that I want to have just this afternoon I was going to talk to them and talk them into this workshop and there, as a result my workshop never happened and I got drugged into bioenergy because I found they were asking really interesting questions um, they were asking questions about landscape pattern and where can you do things to make to make it to improve the social and environmental and economic arena and I'm still finding they're answering interesting questions so um, and asking them so today I'm going to kind of start with stuff we've done over the last couple of years that some of you may have heard and I'm going to end with where we're leaping off in the future so so I won't have you know all the answers but I'm kind, kind of giving you this uh, smorgasbord of, of what we've done and where we're headed so I'm going to first talk about the works that we've done on assessment of uh, bioenergy sustainability, um, the indicator approach we've come up with, and then talk about the new area we're focused on calling it landscape design for um, bioenergy, incorporating bioenergy into a landscape that's there, and talk a little bit about our new directions. So this is a slide I made up a long time ago. <laughs> Um, it was, you know, before computers were drawing things, and I asked our graphic artist to kind of, this was the picture of the world where you had this forester over on one side, and he was going to cut down that tree, and he's thinking about all the money he's going to get from it. And then you had this ecologist with the binoculars and books and thinking about the birds and the bees, and that's kind of how the world was for a while. You had them on two sides, and sometimes people point out, I mean, look where that tree is not. Which direction that tree can go? <laughs> But, but I think this is a very old view of the world. We don't think like that, um, certainly in academia, and I don't think in many public arenas as well. We're really putting this together. Now, I showed this uh, slide to an audience that included an African woman, and she said, well, if we were thinking of that now, you would show the branches of the trees, and you'd have another person. You'd have the woman taking the branches and using that for firewood. And, and I showed it to a Chinese audience. They said, and you would have the Chinese people out there collecting the fruits from this or the nuts and, and using that. So, so the use of the tree and the benefits, the ecosystem services, the social services, the economic benefits, are something that we are looking at together. And of course, not just a single tree, but the whole landscape. So this is kind of my slide of how it's developed. And I need to get our graphic artists to draw these other people in there. Um, haven't done that yet. So the approach that we have um, adopted and talked the Department of Energy into doing is kind of shown here. When you're looking at a large scale, it might be a watershed, it might be a larger landscape. First, you have to think about what are the indicators that relate to the goals that you have for this area? And then you think about, okay, what are the baseline and targets for that? Then you have to evaluate the indicator values in that particular context, look at trends and trade-offs, and hopefully you're going to come up with something like um, what's called best management practices. We try to use good practices because we'll probably never get the best. But this is all a circle. So what we've done a pretty good job of right now is identifying the indicators. <laughs> and we're looking at case studies to kind of move us along this approach. But that is where we are headed. And we're working with um, many other groups to try and do this approach. So that's what I'm going to tell you about. Uh, this chart I love that Elena Chum put together shows all the groups in the world that are thinking about indicators for bioenergy. You're not supposed to read it. <laughs> and then the green areas are the ones that Oak Ridge are involved with. And every time I show this, Elena says, oh, but there are more. Everything's not included. There are lots of groups trying to think about this. And some of them are listed here. Um, so this is not a unique thing. But we have found that 
some of these indicators really focus on management practices, performance indicators, those are called, rather than results indicators. And we don't know yet, uh, you know, really how to manage for bioenergy because it's a pretty new activity. So we're kind of ahead of the horse there. And implementation is really hindered by them being too numerous. Uh, several of these have hundreds of indicators. And so if you have lots of measures, you're going to measure it for a long time before you get around to do it. It's very costly. It's very broad. It's very difficult to measure. So our approach was to try to come up with a science-based approach that really would um, get at the heart of what needs to be known. So we wanted to come up with indicators that would be useful to the policymakers as well as to the producers of the bioenergy, of the biofuel. Um, it would be what we, the term we was technically effective or science-based. We know it would be sensitive to the stresses. There'd be some known, near, known variability, so when it changed, we could um, respond to that. And practical. That means easily measured, and it would be appropriate for the context where we're applying it, but broadly applicable. So we don't want some measure that's only useful here, but if you're thinking about it, comparing it to a system of sugarcane in Brazil, you couldn't necessarily do that. So this is kind of our criteria that we came up with many years ago um, for indicators, building upon a huge amount of literature in that area. And after many years of work, we came up with our two measures. So the McBride et al. paper, we often talk about McBride et al., but we happen to have McBride himself in the audience, <laughs> um, came up with our um, set of social, uh, set of environmental indicators in six categories, greenhouse gas, soil, water, air, biological diversity, and productivity. And then we did another companion paper where it came up with our indicators in the socioeconomic arena. Um, and it was critical to note that the measures and interpretations are context specific because some people wanted to say, if you know this, you know it about every place. And that would be wonderful, but we found that it really is context specific. So I'm going to go through and show you what these indicators are if you haven't seen them, but I won't spend too much time on them. So the McBride paper comes up with the ones that are listed here, 19 particular indicators. What's important that our work did that other indicator work hasn't done is we defined um, the units of measure. And if you don't have the units of measure, you don't really know what you're talking about. This was really a collective consensus approach by multiple authors and building strongly upon the literature, embedding it with as many people that we could get listening to us. But they're pretty straightforward. Soil um, is the organic matter, total <coughs> nitrogen, extract extractable phosphorus, and bulk density. My job was kind of to try and limit the number, but I didn't do so well in the water area because Pat Mulholland is really, uh, was really adamant about um, what needed to be measured. But what we came up with was a limited set of what you needed to know about the environment to understand what we were thinking about for sustainability of bioenergy in the environment. Um, it was also important that we think about this across the whole um, a supply chain. So many efforts only look at the biomass production, but in the logistical area, moving all of that matter, huge amounts of matter, to the plant, there are um, a lot of problems. That's where road ecology comes in, um, because if you've seen these um, vehicles going down the road, they're, they're overweight, they're difficult to see, there's material dropping off. Then you get to the conversion facility, then you have another transport activity, and then you have the end use where um, blend conditions and so forth come up. So there are lots of different places where you have to think about this. And what we did and is laid out here was for each of our categories of environmental indicator, we thought about where it was important with a, with a green color showing that it was important in this particular area. It could be positive or negative, but it just could change, and where it's white, these aspects are not so important. And this is valuable for people who only think about the biomass production side to say environmental indicators occur across the board. We have to think about the environmental impacts. And um, for some of our measures, like greenhouse gas, I show here in blue, it occurs in every single box. So when you're thinking about greenhouse gas emissions, improving it or or um, what the effects are. You have to look across the whole biofuel supply chain to understand what you're talking about. And we've done the same kind of work for socioeconomic indicators. This is where our um, social scientists and economists were really helpful. 
this was a little more difficult. For instance, in social well-being, you have measures like employment, household income, and work days lost to injury that most companies report. When we drive into Oak Ridge National Lab, there's a little sign up there sometimes that tell you how many work days are lost to injury. This is something companies report. But the food security is a really hard one. And we show it in white here, meaning that there's no agreement in the community of how to even measure it. People measure it in different ways. And so that's why there's such a debate about food security in the world. We don't even know what we're talking about. And we're working now with FAO and others who are trying to get a better understanding of what is meant by food security and how you go about measuring that. But several of these of component, components like energy security premium, there is not agreement about how to measure it. And that's, that's a challenge in itself. We came up with our units that we thought was reasonable, but everybody um, doesn't agree with that. But when I show for food security, percent change in food price volatility, it's interesting how many people have commented on that and said, yeah, that's really what's going to be important. What's the volatility due to bioenergy that you don't get um, due to other activities that are going on in the, in the system? So again, we're go going through all of these. What's important here, you know, energy security, trade, profitability, resource conservation. We get some of the resource conservation measures in the environmental arena because we're talking about um, air quality and water quality. But what we don't capture is depletion of non-renewable resources like fossil fuel. If you compare the measures here to use of fossil fuel, which is going to be used up, you get a very different measure than if you don't have that on the table. <clears throat> and social acceptability may be one of the hardest ones. How do you measure public opinion and transparency? And then you get into having to know if you're having effective participation of all the stakeholders in the process, because that's got to be a part of it, as well as risk of catastrophe. And we think, again, that's an area where bioenergy is going to um, show some benefits, because if you compare fossil fuels, where you have things like um, accidents in the Gulf of Mexico, whereas with biofuels, you may have one truck having an accident or, or something like that. So it's a very different level of risk. And so we think having all of these on the table is what is really important. And that's a theme I'll get to later. Bioenergy has been used as an excuse by many communities for being sustainable. And it's kind of a problem that there's unfair weight given to bioenergy. But we see it really as an opportunity to think about in a science-based quantitative means, what does sustainability really mean? And how can this approach be applied to other attributes? Now, we've uh, thought about how this applies across the supply chain, just like we did with the environmental indicators. And again, there's lots of yellow, meaning the socioeconomic attributes don't occur just in one part of the fuel cycle. Um, there, there are many places that one has to look at it, which makes it harder but easier. And we're not saying that all projects or all activities need to look at every one of these, but we're just saying that, that um, we have a checklist, is how we talk about it, of potential indicators you need to think about. And if you're studying only this box here, maybe there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that, but think about it in the context of the broader box, recognizing that there are other aspects where um, that's the one for social acceptability due to resource management is going to be really important. So we hope to provide that this provides a context for study and interpretation of sustainability. Um, so now we're moving ahead to think about how this work applies to particular context. As I said, we think of our indicator set kind of as a, a starting point. If you go to a particular system, maybe you don't need to um, think about all of these indicators, or maybe you need to add new, a new one. Maybe there's a particular pollutant in your case, or maybe you have really abundant water supply, so water quantity may not be such an issue. You have to think about it in case cases. And we're recognizing that the protocols for these measures may need to be um, context specific, but we're working with other groups to have them as broad as possible. So for instance, measuring carbon in the soil um, is not so straightforward always because the depth where you take the uh, soil collection is really important. And, you know, we're looking at places in uh, Mexico where it's a very karst environment versus places in Canada where it's very deep soil. So 
what we're telling people is, is for that situation, you have to think about the depth of the rooting zone and have your soil sample be in relation to the depth of the rooting zone. And so ways that we can have a standard protocol but have it be context specific is, is where we're headed. And again, we have to work with other groups who are out doing some of the field measures in order to come up with some of these. Um, another point I've made already is that we think it's really important to interpret the suite as a whole. <coughs> it is amazing to me now that all of these aspects of the environment and the social system that we care about are at the table. People are talking about biodiversity in a way they didn't talk about it 20 years ago. They're talking about risk. They're talking about a lot of things. And it would be a real mistake if we had a, a methodology that allowed us to um, inappropriately take something off the table. I say this because I was on the Science Advisory Board for EPA for many years, and they've ados adopted a risk-based approach. And whenever they looked at a new chemical being introduced to the environment, they would go through all this environmental analysis, and they go through all this health effects. And the value of a human life was uh, specified by a tort case to be X million dollars, six million dollars, anyway. It was, it was a high number, and whenever you came down to the bottom, this value of human life outweighed all the environmental values, so all that work never made it to the decision maker, and that was kind of a shame because it was just a matter of the process. So we need to come up with methodologies for keeping the appropriate information at the table, and that's kind of the challenge that we're still trying to address. It's, it's really hard, and I know that many of you are trying to address that same challenge in different contexts here. So one of the things that we had to think about, okay, we have all these indicators. How do you figure out which one to really use in a particular situation? So we came up with this framework. So first you have to think about the goals for a particular assessment or analysis and think about the context and who the stakeholders are. And collectively with all of those in hand, you can determine the specific objective for any one analysis. Am I really focused on water quality and quantity here? Am I looking at the biomass side of the supply system? Um, and then you need to think about, okay, what are potential trade-offs that I'm going to have in this system? It might be money at the very beginning. You don't have money to measure everything. And then with that information, you, you can look at the criteria um, for selecting the indicators and then identify and rank the indicators that meet that criteria going back to the data that's already available or the data that you may, already, that you may be able to collect with the resources that you have in hand. Then you identify um, your gaps and ability to address goals. And to do this, you have to think about baselines and targets and estimate the values for the indicators. Eventually, you come down and you say, were my objectives achieved? Most of the time, they're not. So then you go back and kind of reassess where you're going. But at the same time, you hope that you're coming up with lessons learned, again, management practices that are appropriate to this context. That's kind of where you're trying to go with this whole approach. So we have started uh, applying this to a case of switchgrass because our colleagues in the, in the Institute of Agriculture have a very large project that we help them get funded through USDA AFRICAP um, to look at switchgrass. And as you may know, the governor of Tennessee guaranteed farmers a price for five years for the switchgrass, so there was a real incentive for them to, to grow that crop. And we were able to go out and collect soil and to suggest where they planted the crops because there were more farmers applying for this than there were some options and we ran the model that I'm going to show you before they planted it and now we're working with colleagues here at the university to collect the data to, to validate our model. So we're kind of in the midstream of that. But switchgrass, as you may know, is a native plant in Tennessee and it has some pretty amazing properties. Oops, it can be grown on um, extremely marginal land and, again, roads. It, it, I've seen it in road beds where it hasn't rained and the plants are about that high without any rain for the last six weeks. It does very well. It uh, provides um, nesting um, habitat for Hensler sparrow and for invertebrates. It has a really deep root um, that it requires lower fertilizer because it turns out if you apply fertilizer in the first year, you, the competitors, the weeds, actually do much better than switchgrass and they'll outgrow it. So the system is better if you don't apply any fertilizer in the first year. Um, it's m pretty massive, so it reduces wind erosion. It has all these amazing properties and uh, now has a market. And we chose switchgrass as one example. I show this map just to say 
Switch grass isn't the answer everywhere, and my colleagues have worked on uh, thinking about what is appropriate um, crops in other places. This map just, just shows it very crudely, but there was a lot of work that goes into the soils, the climate, um, the socioeconomic conditions that are appropriate for allowing the, um, the producers to grow and utilize different crops. So here in Tennessee, we're looking at switchgrass as a, as a model crop. It's not the only one. So, um, so Esther Parrish led up a study where we put together a um, spatial optimization model that we asked the question, where should we locate the plantings of this energy crop that is needed to feed the particular um, uh, plant that's in Vinor? So we, we knew how much it needed on an annual basis and calculated that, and with our model asked, where should we do that? And the model was made up as a combination of a couple of models, SWAT, soil water assessment tool, that allows you to look at hydrologic conditions as well as cropping conditions, fertilizer, and so forth um, in these particular watersheds, as well as the polysys economic model that um, produces uh, the economic conditions under which it's appropriate to grow the switchgrass. And the results of this, it was a pretty massive modeling effort because it was spatially explicit in all possible combinations, so we ended up using our supercomputer to, um, to run all possible combinations. And the way we show our results is by, um, by looking at the percent achieved compared to the optimal. And we defined our runs by what the goal was. So one of this run that I'm showing you here was where we maximized nitrogen reduction. So we ran it until that threshold of of the nitrogen reduction was achieved. So by definition, we get 100% of a reduction in nitrogen, but what we're really looking at is how profit and phosphorus and sediment came out. And you see phosphorus came out pretty good, but sediment didn't. But that's how each of these scenarios is run. So we have scenarios of maximizing um, phosphorus reduction, sediment reduction, maximizing profit, and then a balanced one. So maximizing profit is what the farmers are doing now. That's business as usual, pretty much. And you can see you don't do very well in terms of water quality. But when we wrote our optimization equation to have this balance objective, um, you do pretty well in all the characteristics. And this is because this is the locations that are near the road, because that's going to maximize the profit, on fairly good soils, maybe on steeper soils, because that's going to reduce the um, sediments. But again, we ran through the iteration, and it chose the areas that did this. And what it tells us is um, you can actually do pretty well. Now, the farmers, when I show them this, say, we don't want any reduction in our profit at all. But what if there were a market which gave value to um, the ecosystem services of clean water? Then, if there was that, if there was a market like um, Home Depot has for sustainable wood, then if there was a sustainable energy, bioenergy market, then you might be able to achieve this. So we're working with several groups working toward a certification process to see if we can get um, measures like water quality and some of the other attributes I talked about, part of that certification. And then this has to be a market demand system, so there would really be an opportunity there. And what our research is trying to show is that there really is a possibility to do this. Um, Last week I was at a meeting with UNEP and they had this great term, they call it, talked about water smart energy. And that's what we're talking about here. I think that makes a lot of sense to talk about smart energy in terms of all kinds of environmental and social benefits that can be achieved. So this is just a map of, of the watershed and I should point out that, so the watershed drains this way and most of the area up here in these watersheds are forested and we didn't allow deforestation as part of it. So that's why um, these are the sub-watersheds where you have most of it, of uh, the um, biomass coming from. But the colors here, this is the scenario, um, right, let's see here, this is the balanced one um, where the sediment uh, quality is, is shown. So you can see there's different spatial configurations when we do this optimization, with this being the result from that. Um, but our colleagues in agriculture and engineering are spending $700,000 a year in order to validate our models. And 
we know the models are just models and we want to have them validated. So it's really expensive to collect the kind of water quality data you really need. And we think in actuality that's going to be a difficult thing for farmers or foresters to do. So we're trying to look at, at um, other measures that can convey water quality. So that's why we are turning to um, the EPT index, um, Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, Trichoptera, or our orders of insects that are pretty easy to sort. This index has been used around the world for different measures of water quality, but we haven't seen anybody who's used it in conjunction with um, bioenergy. So we're asking the question, um, in these areas where we have the water quality measures and where um, the state of Tennessee is already collecting the ETP, EPT index as a measure of water quality, is that a good measure for how the bioenergy affects the environment? And if that is true, that will simplify our measures quite a bit. So Lada Bhaskaran is, is leading this work and it isn't quite finished, but I just wanted to tell you that's, that's an important direction because we've come up with their water quality benefits, but we have to come up with a way that it could easily be measured and we haven't gotten there yet. So now we're trying to look at kind of more of a landscape approach. This figure has been around Oak Ridge and USDA for many years, and, and I always like it. It really shows um, the crop being produced in the landscape and being taken to the facility and then being moved out in the community, um, maybe some recycling occurring. Um, you have greenhouse gases that are part of the system, but the vision is of an integrated system and people have been talking about that a while, but we still haven't quite come up to doing it, and that's what some of our work is leading to now. So first we have to think about, you know, think about negative impacts of bioenergy and how that can be avoided or reduced. And so we, work looking at the literature that's out there, of course, came up with three basic principles. You have to conserve the ecosystem and social services that are in the area, that's critical. You have to think about the local context, the effects of bioenergy, um, and think about uh, the services being context specific, and so the management practices have to be context specific. And you have to monitor effects of concern and adjust the plans, use adaptive management. So I love this picture. When we were in Australia, uh, sitting at our hotel, this truck pulls up, and they're obviously, you know, taking the waste from this hotel, and they're using it for bioenergy, very context-specific management. And when I first pulled up the title of my slide, um, Eric, is it, said, oh, Indonesia is having a real problem, you know. And that's because they do have a lot of ecosystem services, and their focus isn't on, on conserving what they have. They have political um, pressure to really um, take what's in the country and not thinking about what is there. So. Addressing these three objectives is really hard. <laughs> it's not something you can just say. There has to be um, some efforts to get communities to adopt these principles, but without them, uh, any kind of resource extraction is going to be really hard. So um, we wanted to implement and think about how landscape design offers a means to have appropriate use of concurrent conditions and provide for sustainable bioenergy systems. And um, to do this, we are thinking first about what are the pressures and obstacles and how we can move ahead. And so I found this really interesting paper um, in the Journal of Cleaner Production that's really about um, business opportunities, but I think it's very appropriate to landscape design. So we took some of their ideas and adopted it to what can happen for bioenergy systems. And some of the pressures and incentives for uh, landscape design are legal demands and regulations. And we are finding that exists already because Europe, the EU, has strong definitions of sustainability. The challenge is that their definitions don't always relate to what happens in the United States or Canada. For instance, um, I was just telling one of them last week that we don't have a forest protection. Forests are not always forests. They can be transferred into um, urban and suburban areas. And in fact, in the southeast, that's the biggest pressure that you see upon forests. And they were astounded. They said, you don't protect your forest. And so their rules are written with certain perspectives in mind that we don't always have here. Um, another incentive is, whoops, I keep going backwards, is, is customer demands. This is what happens with the, um, with the sustainable wood. Um, 
uh, and sustainable fish that you see in Walmart. In the latter case, the World Wildlife Fund and other conservation groups were really um, instrumental in going to the groups, um, the buyer, and asking them to define and call for sustainability. So it could be a response to stakeholders. Uh, it always um, offers a competitive advantage if the stakeholders are interested in sustainability or some term like this. There may be environmental pressure groups. Reputation loss is a big one too. We've had big companies like P&G come to us and they have a fairly active area in sustainability for their reputation reasons. But the obstacles to developing and deploying this landscape design are listed here. It requires um, a lot of upfront planning. Um, it requires um, coordination and complexity. You have to think across the supply chain. You have to get different groups with different interests involved. Um, it can have higher costs, but it's really higher initial costs. Um, again and again, studies have shown that if you do your planning up front, you, you can reduce costs later on. Um, it depends on what your time frame is. Um, and there may be um, insufficient or missing communication in the supply chain. People don't always know what's happening at the other end of the system. Um, so what promotes la uh, landscape design? It's kind of the opposite of what we talked about, having good communication, um, having good management systems. So some of my colleagues at Oak Ridge are working on ISO standards for bioenergy sustainability, which is an unbelievable challenging negotiation process with, uh, involving parties from all the different countries in the world and figuring out how to come up with the definition. Um, when we have those ISO standards or other kind of um, standards, it really helps the industry, but in bioenergy, we're not quite there. And it also involves training and education of the people involved in the process. So um, this grant through UT is setting up a training program at Auburn to help um, the foresters who go out in the field learn how to properly cut trees for bioenergy purpose, or in, in those cases, it's often the tops of trees and the extension agents here have done a really good job teaching the farmers of how to plant switchgrass. It was a crop that they had never had before. So the first time they put it out, they, they lost all the seed because the, the drills were too big and the machines and, and, and switchgrass seeds are really tiny compared to um, corn or, or other seeds that they had. So, so adjusting the equipment, figuring out how to do that and then teaching the um, producers how to do it right took a lot of work and that's where extension agents are extremely valuable. And then integrating this whole perspective into corporate policy has got to be really important. The people at all levels need to understand this is hard to do sometimes. Um, so we've come up with a few recommended practices, again, building upon a lot of work that other people have done. Um, you have to pay attention to the site or the region where you're going to be doing this. You have to think about location and selection of the feedstocks, particularly to your area, transport, and then the refinery process as well as the end use is going to be really important. Um, monitoring and reporting as you go along with the process is critical and using that to, to think about how you actually manage the system. A key thing is attention to what is doable. Many times we've, we find our colleagues come in and have these grand schemes but they're not actually able to be implemented in real situations. And so working with the people, that's again where our extension agents and people who have on the ground experience have been really good. For me working at Oak Ridge, we have kind of the balance between the applied as well as the theoretical and trying to figure out what should be done and, and working with others of how to do it. And then the communication of environmental opportunities. People don't always know what could be done and that's where I think modeling um, is, is very helpful and um, uh, thinking about the opportunities that are out there in a quantitative sense. So this is a graph um, that is uh, pretty new that shows the tenfold increase in the pellet industry from 2000 to 2010 that has occurred um, throughout the world. And what's important is this dark blue is the amount of material that comes from the United States. And I'll show you some pictures of this. Basically, this is the tops of trees, the branches of trees that used to be left in the forest. Have you ever driven by an area that was recently logged and seen that huge pile that's left there? Sometimes it's burned 
Um, sometimes it just slowly decomposes, um, but where it is, it's just, it's kind of a mess. They pull it all together. And this is the wood that is being um, uh, made into pellets and shipped to Europe. It's amazing that our waste, um, once it gets on a railway car and then on a barge and goes to Europe, can actually um, make sense in terms of uh, transport costs. And you can see the light blue, Europe is even producing more. But Europe is, is very interested in our waste and the opportunity to use that wood. But they also have their restrictions for sustainability. So we are working with several others. And I'm going to be running a workshop with um, other people from the Department of Energy, our, our other co-laboratories, with the industry next week to help them think about what their goals are and how landscape design can be incorporated into their approaches so that they meet the demands for Europe. And this is what this system looks like. These are some photographs that I took in October in southern Georgia, where um, traditional forestry is going on. They're taking the wood out for, um, for lumber or other um, purposes, and they're sorting it into sizes. And it's the very small stuff that normally would be left in the forest that, again, is being shipped out. Um, so um, Nadine here is from the, the Forest Sustainability Initiative, which is an outfit which goes and um, ensures that practices are being used to meet sustainability standards. Unfortunately, those <coughs> sustainability standards don't address greenhouse gas emissions. So we're trying to um, make sure that's done. And um, in this practice, uh, they take the tops of the trees, but the branches and very small pieces are still drugged back into the forest. So there is some um, attention to um, soil rejuvenation. And also, they make sure that any places that have unique flora and fauna or other conditions are protected. That's part of how this system is set up. And the system works very well for the large um, landowners. We're on Plum Creek land. Warehouser uses this same kind of approach. The challenge is about 80% of the forestry that goes on in the southeastern United States is small private landowners. And they don't always know about or engage um, groups like SFI to certify their, their wood. And so it, doesn't, it isn't right now going to be able to meet the market demands. Most of the wood that's going to Europe is coming from these large private foresters. Um, so this, the larger wood, I just thought was amazing because um, this stuff is being cut to container size. We have all these empty containers going back to China. This wood is being put in those and shipped whole to China. And they're using it for scaffolding and cr concrete forms. And you know, it's, this is really good pine. It's pretty amazing to me that we can actually um, have that kind of market. And they track this really well. We just picked this up on the ground. This is. This is a um, ticket that's, that has a barcode on it, and it goes with every shipment of wood from the field to, to the train car or to the middle-sized wood goes to a pulp factory. So it's tracked from the field as to um, many conditions that, that were out there. Um, they're doing a really good job of, of tracking it. Again, this is a large private um, landowner. You're not going to see this kind of attention in the small private landowners. So when we're thinking about landscape design and how we have to apply this, we have to think about, are we going to you know, start with the whole system? And this is kind of the European approach. They're the end users over here, and they're going back to us in the United States or Canada and having their conditions meet our needs. But maybe you can just look at the feedstock production or even a smaller part of it, a private landowner, and provide information to that landowner in context of where that land occurs and its environment to help them understand you know, how to move ahead. But these are the kind of questions that we'll be addressing next week to, with the stakeholders to see what's doable in their situation. Um, so our summary for this landscape design is, as we do this work, you have to set the goals for the particular context, consider the constraints, address the waste, because that's where the opportunity is here, evaluate and apply the solutions. And then as you go, monitor for adaptive management so you can learn about the appropriate management that is there. And when I talk, people often say, OK, well, this is what you're kind of doing now. Where are your next steps? So I thought I'd jump in and give you just a few comments about where we're headed. But I don't have any answers for that. But I thought you might be interested in this. 
So one of the key challenges, as I said, ha is how do you pull all this information together and think about how to integrate it? So we're kind of thinking about three approaches. One is more um, a statistical approach. We've heard other uh, talks at UT um, uh, where people pull together information and present it in different ways and use some of these um, visualization techniques that are out there. So we're working on that. And then we also have Nate Polish here who's helping us with aggregation theory and then the gaming part. So I'm going to mention these um, briefly. So multi-attribute decision support systems, MADS, um, some of you know that because we had um, we had a visiting uh, professor from the Stefan Institute in Slovenia who came here and taught a course. And so we're applying this approach that looks at attribute scales and you develop a tree of attributes that's appropriate for your situation and then utility functions. And so you develop the tree and you come up here. In this case, this was a pasture productivity situation in New Zealand where they looked at soil quality management practices and habitat quality, and you come up under your positive scenario of improving water quality, but in your negative scenario, a red means a decline in habitat conditions as well as soil quality. So we are in the midst of collecting all this data around Venor so that we can apply this kind of an approach to, um, to thinking about the multiple attributes uh, for um, sustainability in the way we've defined it, in that case where switchgrass is planted. So that's one approach. And then Nate is working on aggregation theory, which um, is a mathematical approach to pulling together different kinds of information. And you find this approach being used in all kinds of sciences, but he points out that much of it has arisen from work in ecology and economics and social sciences, as well as mathematics. And so he's in the process now of um, characterizing the attributes of aggregation theory and thinking about which of those are particularly applicable to sustainability so that when we pull together information using something like an arithmetic mean or a geometric mean or different kinds of statistical approaches, how true are we to the characteristics of the um, situation that we're applying? And then the really fun one is what I'm working with Bob Costanza and a whole other group with is is gaming. So there's a huge amount of gaming that's going on in the world. Um, we found, you know, 58% of Americans play games with the average age being 30. I'm, I mean, I bet everyone has played one of these games. You know, is Candy Crusher a big one? I like Words with Friends. You know, SimCity, but we're talking about smart games, those kind of things. People are using these games. And so what we are thinking about is, is if we can use crowdsourcing of ecosystem information in order to have real simulations and not only use it as an education tool, it's pretty obvious that when people play SimCity, they learn about city management. When people play these other games, they'll learn about ecosystem and social services. But can you also use it as a um, research tool? So instead of going out and through evaluation studies, sampling the people by doing surveys, can you set up your uh, game so that you can sample them by saying, before you play this game, you know, what are your goals? And, and ask them questions and have them reveal um, what they think about ecosystem services through this game. So it's a really fun, engaging activity. And I just thought it'd be useful to tell you a little bit about what we're doing here. So that's my life slide. I just kind of wanted to give you a picture of where we're headed and where we're coming from. And it's kind of interesting for me because I've done lots of different things over the time period I've been involved, but bioenergy that I stayed away from for years, because Oak Ridge has been involved in it a long time, has proven to be such a rich area in order to ask the kind of questions I'm interested in and trade-offs and spatial arrangements and, and how you actually get the science that we're trying to um, make headway on out to the people where it can make a difference. So, and I know that's a lot of what Nimbus is about, too. So I appreciate you letting me come and talk to you about it. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. Um, 
It's, it's streaming, um, so you don't really... <laughs> so uh, I'd be interested, uh, given the, the different bits of the talk, in what role you see for spatial optimization in landscape design. So in here you had the results from the Venor refinery study of an optimization model, mm -hmm. but you also had uh, the results and discussion about practicalities of seeing change. Um, and the intervention, so read control, uh, was not all that spatial, but its impact was spatial. So we might think about the five-year price support you described, or we might think about a certification scheme. These are not spatially optimized, but they have a spatial impact. So what scope do you see for spatial optimization in these kind of, this kind of work? I think spatial optimization is a way to show the possibilities. I think in practice, you're not going to do spatial optimization as a technique for a real assessment of this activity. But when I show these kind of results to people, they say, oh, this is really a possibility. And, and with your work, when people see that there's a possibility you know, to pull the information together and to, to optimize not just one metric, but several at the same time, and that making spatial decisions is what it's all about, I think that possibility is what is really important. And so, um, so you have to show the possibilities, but then when you actually do it, you have to come up with something that is doable. And this is what we were talking about um, earlier in the day. Um, uh, I had a debate in the literature with some people about, do you believe models? Somebody wrote, why don't we believe the models? And I wrote, models aren't for belief, <laughs> you know, they're for understanding. And I think that's what this is about, that these complex models help us understand the possibilities in the system um, and help us um, uh, see the complexity as well, but you also need other kinds of tools in, in uh, a, a real assessment uh, or even a certification approach. And I'm sure you could follow up on that. <laughs> I have a question about your first part of the talk, which was about uh, indicators. You said that the indicators should be considered an integrated suite, but you also said that um, you know, budgets may require subtracting some indicators. So do you rank indicators? And if so, by what metric? And um, what kind of problems do you run into if, you know, when, when you're trying to rank them? Well, I think it's, it's a stakeholder engagement that, that has to be involved in this kind of um, decision. I wouldn't call it ranking. I'd call it a decision process. <laughs> um, and it depends upon the goals that you have. And if you, if you make decisions about what you're going to pursue in the context of the broader goals, I think you're being more honest with yourself and more true to the system um, because it may be that X, you know, air quality, water quality, whatever, is just going to be too expensive to measure. But, um, but maybe you can get information from another place that is relevant to it. So I think the knowledge that you have about the system is going to be very important. But in reality, these stakeholder engagement groups and when you talk about landscape design, um, many people emphasize that collaborative activity that has to occur at the very beginning as being such a huge part of it. I didn't, I didn't emphasize that so much today, but that collaboration of, of what are individual goals, what the collective goal is, and so how does that influence what you care about and therefore you know, what you measure in, in within the knowledge of what could be variable. Okay, I, I guess maybe I'm a, a naive scientist, but um, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess it's, it's related to this idea of setting goals, but you, you, you know, sort of stated in this, in the title of the, or the name of the center with this uh, sustainability in the title, and you, you then go about talking about how you want to, you had that balanced approach where you had profit and nitrogen and whatever, all these different indicators, you were trying to maximize them and all. And I was, it was interesting that you didn't have uh, one where you were just maximizing the sort of sustainable things and then looking at how profitabil profitability would come out uh, if you were leaving no impact on the environment. It seemed like at any, at all of those, you were sort of at some point not leaving the environment with no zero impact. So that sort of seems to be self-defeating oh. in a sustainability goal. I don't know. 
Okay, I, I may be interpreting your question wrong, but you're right. We didn't do the scenario where we just looked at water quality measures and didn't look at profit. No one's ever asked me that before. I hadn't thought of it, so that's, that's a good point. But, but another point you raised that I think is really important is uh, often I start with saying energy is dirty. You know, people affect the environment. Sustainability is a misnomer entirely. Everything that we do has an impact on the environment. It's really all about trade-offs what is less worse, and, you know, given, you know, and obviously if you say that, then you say the first things in terms of energy or any use is to, you know, is to reduce your use, recycle, you know, um, um, think about not having as much use and impact on the environment, but even so, everything we do it, it, it affects the environment. Human, the human race is not sustainable in some sense, but in the short time that we are here, <laughs> It's true. <laughs> you know, anyway. <laughs> so I think change is what ecology is all about, but we're trying to look at trade offs and what is less worse. And sustainability of the human race is what we all doing this about. So right. we, we have to consider that in sustainability. We can't just leave the human, the economic, the social aspect away. This is, it should be considered in the equation when we. Yeah, but I really think it's true that, you know, energy, energy is bad. <laughs> you know, you right. can, every, everything has impacts. So. so I was um, a little disappointed that the profit max uh, objective did so poorly. Um, but it occurs to me that most of those other things were having impacts that would happen off site. Um, sedimentation, maybe nitrogen in the water, phosphorus in the water, things like that. I'm wondering if there have been any sorts of efforts to create switchgrass cooperatives like you might see, I know there's dairy cooperatives are quite popular around here. I wonder if there's any, been any effort to create those things maybe to try to internalize some of these effects. Well, there, this whole effort was moving along fantastically and then we had something come on board called natural gas. And with natural gas, the market for bioenergy has really dropped off. And the bioenergy activity that is occurring is looking at um, corn grain or corn stover. So it's really moving to areas where corn is being uh, produced. And so um, switchgrass, we showed all these potential benefits, but with um, the price of, of energy being pretty low now, um, there isn't the market incentive to pursue even that. But um, you're right, and we see in the sugarcane in Brazil, these cooperatives are really, um, really important and really a good approach to getting to small private landowners. And so next week when we meet with the, um, with the uh, pellet industry people, we are definitely having groups representing the small tree farmers there because that is the way to get, that I've experienced in getting to those kind of groups collectively. And, and there are several such tree grow grower associations. Uh, Virginia, I'm going to ask a follow-up question that may be politically incorrect, so you, don't, you shouldn't feel obligated to answer it. But the state of Tennessee, which doesn't have a lot of resources, devoted, I think, $70 million or so to what was supposed to be a major switchgrass initiative that was supposed to benefit lots of locals. And what you just described is a situation in which that was probably a poor investment of limited state resources in the sense that it didn't uh, take into account the switch to natural gas and, and other aspects of bioenergy. Well, in, so in, re in retrospect, that is true, but did we know natural gas was going to come on board at that time? Um, well, can we partition this to say that it was natural gas? I mean, is there any way to actually know uh, that uh, that this wouldn't have happened otherwise. Well, we don't really know, but we do know that the price is going to be a big uh, effect. And you know, the best thing we could do to encourage this kind of activity is have a carbon tax, um, and that will have people pay for the actual carbon opportunities, cost, and benefits. Okay. Uh, there was. Uh, using bioenergy has a direct impact on the production of, of food products as well. 
Um, are you incorporating food product indicators and the effect they have downstream for like global food prices as part of your sustainability uh, evaluation process? Well, food is really important. And as I said, there's no agreed upon measure for food security, but we are part of a workshop that's going to be in October, November about um, food and energy. And, you know, some people propose that uh, you can't use food crops for energy. It really competes with the market. But, um, as many people know, food is largely a distribution issue. It isn't the availability. And in places like uh, the Dominican Republic, um, do much better if you grow a crop that has different values. It's valuable for food and it's valuable for energy. If people grow a crop like Jatropa that has proven to be not very helpful, it's the, the beans are actually poisonous. If people grow that and then if there's um, a food crisis, they can't eat this crop that they've been growing. It's, it makes a lot more sense to grow something that has multiple markets. And this is what Brazil is doing with sugarcane. Um, and the price of sugar influences the price of the bioenergy that they have. So um, our general approach is it makes more sense to grow something that has multiple purposes um, and, to, and to make use of it for the most appropriate purpose. Obviously, you have to feed people and you have to feed them with um, good quality food, but we have to address the distribution part of, of uh, food. And, and byproducts like the corn stover is, is um, really important. There are places where yield is high that you have to take the stover off the ground in order to do no-till agriculture, which has a lot of benefits to soil and water properties. You're going to be taking that off anyway or you're reducing your um, productivity. So why not use that material for bioenergy? So again, it's, it's about seeing the opportunities. Okay. <laughs> so I would be interested, Virginia, in hearing a bit about uh, given the context of the talk, what you see is the role for prices in here and maybe non-market valuation. So prices obviously appeared in the talk at different times in different ways. So if we think about the EPA case you described, where you talked about uh, the value of a statistical life uh, meant that the appropriate you wanted to keep the appropriate information at the table. So that was a statement about how prices were playing in here. Mm -hmm. and if I think about the, the table of possible indicators in there, you'd highlighted 10 minimum practical indicators. I didn't get them all scribbled down, but they looked like ones I would say were disproportionately closer to market to relative to some of those that didn't make the 10 minimum practical indicator list, like food security. Mm -hmm. um, or if I think about the strategies, when you talk about um, we need to map the stuff to the supply chain, we need to ensure there is communication along the supply chain and certification being one way to do that, that's really about establishing price signals. So what do you see as the role of prices and valuation in here? Okay, that's a really hard question <laughs> because um, I've been involved in a lot of these valuation exercises where you, you know, value ecosystem services and they're always artificial, um, kind of by the nature of the beast. It's really a hard thing to do, I think. Um, but you have to show people the value somehow of, of clean water and clean whatever, air, whatever you're going to have. I think... Um, you really need to reach people in a way that isn't always through their pocketbooks. <laughs> I remember one of the first stories I heard that got me involved in this, um, a, a farmer, a, a woman who lived on this farm, multi-generation uh, farmer, her, her family had all their um, income from this farm activity. And she was walking across the land with her children and one of the little boys said, I, I wanna, I'm thirsty, I wanna go get a drink from the stream over here. And she said, she was horrified. She said, you can't drink out of our stream. It's, you know, it's got all these chemicals in it. That, that's really dangerous. And so just that little episode to her made her realize that I got to do something. It's not enough to get my farm profit, you know, from this, this land. We need to think about other qualities. So I think if you can reach people in ways that is not just about the monetary value that, that you may have a long-term lasting effect. And that's partly through storytelling. That's what the gaming is kind of about, showing them that there are other benefits. And the valuation work has, has um, a certain value, of course, um, but I think there are other ways to, to reach people as, as well. And the more we can do those, I think the more we can um, get at the heart of things. But the market, if, if there's a market-driven um, demand for these attributes, 
I think that's that's where we can really make a difference, and that's going to come in the price as well. So I kind of want everything to have b both of these. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, thank Virginia again. <laughs>